Well, I thought I, I have a new mic, so it is officially it says Justin on it, so it will be uh, it will be mine. I was kind of sharing one with Michael, and now, man, I've got my own, but it's left side, so I have to get used to that. It's a little different, but. Anyways, good to see everyone here. I thought we would maybe not pick up where we were last time, but we're in the book of Daniel, and we were kind of making our way through the introduction last week, um, and because usually when Jason's gone, we, we fly through things because I talk very fast, and I get very focused in, and um, I, I need to take a breath some tonight, but I figured we could go back um, and re, re-look at some of the things we did last week and, and move into chapter one um, today. So, um, last week we were talking about a timeline, and we're not going to go into all of this, but there's, there's our Assyrian Empire. It's taken over by the Babylonian Empire. Um, after the Assyrians come in, the, the Bab- Babylonians will, will, will take them out. Um, they will, again, we've talked about that last week, about Nineveh that was the capital of Assyria. Babylon takes over the, uh, Nineveh. Um, there's a great battle there. Um, there's a great battle at the, the Battle of Kar Shemesh. Um, next, up there in Haran, they move their capital. There's another battle. There's another great things that happen. Um, I was going to start way ahead in here, um, but it came to the beginning. Um, we're almost there. We did it. Okay. We made it all the way through. It was wonderful. Um, <laughs> so, we, we covered all that material. That was, that was great. So, anyways, the long story short of it is... The southern kingdom has been taken over by Babylon, and Daniel is going back with them. Daniel is going to be one of the, the people that come. We're going to look at that. We're going to read that um, in Daniel 1. So I figured some of the introduction is going over the stuff in Daniel 1, so we'll get to that when we study that. But um, just know that we are looking at um, the book of Daniel, and Daniel, when it starts off, Daniel is being taken captive by good old Nebi, King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, into Babylon. Now, as we were talking about last week, Daniel's name is God is my judge. God is uh, the judge. God is my judge. Um, and so that's what, what's what his name means. Now, in chapter 1, we're going to see that the, the Babylonians, they don't like that. They're going to want to change his name. But Daniel's name means God is my judge. God, Daniel was this man of, of deep faith um, in his deeds. In Daniel 1, um, he is saying, you know, I don't want to defile myself. There's a spiritual implication to that. There's a spiritual reason for him uh, to resist what the king would like him to do at that time. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10, uh, a new king comes in. Um, Daniel, at the end, um, will, will live all the way through the kingdom of Babylon from their rise and being taken over relatively soon in the rise of Babylon to the end of the kingdom of Babylon when that, you know, in the statue, in the dream that we see, the Medo-Persian empire will come in and Daniel is still there. And so Daniel will, um, even under a new rulership, even under a new king, even with a new um, regime brought in, Daniel is still faithful. Daniel is still praising God, worshiping God, going to God. Um, and in Daniel 6, they say, you know, we've got to pray to this statue. We've got to pray to your gods. We've got to pray to all of these things. Um, and Daniel says, I'm going to pray to God um, in, in chapter 6. So he's a man of faith no matter who is the ruler. He's rewarded by God, and, and many different times all throughout this we'll read, even at the end of chapter 1, that, that Daniel will be blessed with this uh, ability not only to learn and to be one of the great youths of, uh, of, of Babylon, if you will, um, but he will also be able to interpret dreams. And so that will show up a couple different times, and he will be rewarded, he will be uh, put into special positions um, by the king when, when God is obviously the power um, God is the power, and when God shows up, power flee. Um, the king, whoever that happens to be at the time, will recognize that the God of Daniel means something. And so Daniel will be uh, exalted through the actions of God um, in the eyes of those kings. Um, and so he will be granted many blessings. Um, he's a contemporary of Jer- Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They, they, uh, we read last week about this kind of circuit, this prophetic circuit where Jeremiah is in the homeland. He is, he is looking out across this. You know, we have the, the book of Lamentations of Jeremiah when, when the, the, the um, temple will eventually be destroyed. Um, and so Jeremiah is, is prophesying for such a long time because the temple won't be destroyed for another about 20 years about is a, a pretty good way of putting it. There, it's, it's like 18 according to the conservative estimates on when these things happened. Um, but the, the 
so Jeremiah is in the homeland. He will watch and still be in Jerusalem when that event occurs. Ezekiel is among the, um, I don't know what you want to call it, the, uh, the laymen of, of the, the, uh, the exiles. And uh, Daniel is among the uh, courts of King Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel's in the king's court, Jeremiah's in Jerusalem, and Ezekiel's with the exile. So there's this three-way um, provision, prophetic speech from God. And I think what that's trying to show us is that God still cares. And that God is still in control. God is still caring about his people. God is still providing for his people. And that the enemy, the pagan gods, did not win over him. He is still providing in every situation that his, his people will find them in. God is still there and still trying to minister, calling them to a, uh, a, a faithful obedience to him. Um, and so Daniel the man, this is, this is who he was when he was living. Um, we know... Uh, uh, few details about his life other than kind of what's explained about him. Um, he was taken when he was relatively young. Um, verse 4 says, youths without blemish. Um, and so, granted, he was anywhere from, you know, a youth of the day, high school age, 12 to about 20, 22, somewhere in there. He was young when he was taken, and he lives throughout that entire period of exile. King Darius will come in and say, hey, you can go back and start building the walls, but it will be 70 years later. And so Daniel, likely at 90-some at the end of, uh, at the end of his, his life in Babylon, um, which will be, again, handed off to other kingdoms uh, that Daniel will live to see. Um, here is the, uh, I think we read this last week, but this is the prophetic word. Uh, this will also come in when we get into chapter 1 about why this is taking place. Um, Isaiah 39, um, when Hezekiah comes in and shows the king of Babylon at the time all of the great riches of the, of the nation and of the temple itself, um, in Isaiah 39, um, Isaiah will come to Hezekiah and say, what's going on? Who, who was here and what did you show him? And I, Hezekiah will say, I showed him everything. I showed him all the stuff that I got. And Isaiah says that because you've done this, behold, the days are coming that your house and all your fathers have laid up in store and this day will be carried to Babylon and nothing will be left. Verse 7, and some of your sons who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away, and they will become officials in the palace of Babylon. And so we talked about that a little bit last week, um, but that is the, the direct cause of Daniel being taken away was the, the, the pride of Hezekiah when the king of Babylon was there. Um, so he lived through the 70 years of captivity. Um, I think it's chapter 6 when king... I think, I think that one's also named King Darius, um, will come to power of the Medes, uh, the Med Medo-Persian Empire. It pleased King Darius to put over the kingdom. So yes, uh, at the end of chapter 5, the Babylonian Empire is, comes to ruin, and a new empire comes. So he was living through the seven years of captivity. He was righteous. He was wise. And Jesus called him a prophet. Um, this was my, my own little funny thing I was going to put in here last week. Um, that we kind of talked about at the end, but brushing over it briefly, this is what we know about Daniel. He, this is how you would describe Daniel. Uh, verse 3 of chapter 1, Daniel 1, 3. Then the king commanded As Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So if you want to describe Daniel, um, he, he is some of, some of the best of the best, the, the, the best and the brightest. Um, I put up there a picture of a prized bull because, you know, it's like, or a prized steer, if you will, um, because he, he, he was, he was uh, weeded out among all the rest of the people there. He was the best of the best, and he is going to be taken back. Um, so that's what, you know, the, the, the thing we know about Daniel, he is, he is, he is a... A bright dude, a good fella, someone that was known to be a shining star among the people. Um, Daniel, the book, is, it's written by Daniel during the 6th century B.C. Um, and so anywhere, you know, uh, I'm going to go back to this sheet. Our handout from last week was talking about how, um, let's see here, about 
597 is the second deportation according to our handout. 586 was the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And then 536 is the fall of the Babylon to the Medo-Persian Empire. So Daniel in Daniel chapter 6 was still alive at that time. Um, it's likely he was writing this book uh, in the 5th century, so anywhere from 500 B.C. to 600 B.C. Um, and so it's likely that's when he was writing this and, and that it was all recorded and written down. Um, it's written in two different languages, Hebrew for the first little bit, um, and then Aramaic for a section, and then Hebrew again at the end. Um, there's lots of people will make this very important that, uh, well, because it was written in two different languages, it was either written by two different people or that it was written at two different times or, you know, whatever. But I, I believe that the reason why is because, let's just read, this is the... These are the things that, that Jason had in the notes. Um, liberal, liberal scholars will go to great lengths to make the case that there was more than one author who contributed to the book of Daniel that was largely written in the second century. The reason why they think it was written in the second ex- century is because it's too accurate. You couldn't have the, 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 the statue with all of the different you know, nations unless those nations were already there and someone was writing about that after the fact. Uh, so it's an interesting... It's too, it's too true, so it can't have been then. Um, it can't have been a prophecy. It had to have been something that they looked back on and, and wrote it in there. Um, this, uh, this other person says that Keel, I don't know who that is, but Keel reasons that since the portion written in Aramaic pertains to the world kingdoms, Daniel wrote in the language of the world kingdoms, um, after reading the attempts of several commentators to explain why it was so written, it seems obvious that we do not know. Since the Bible does not offer an explanation, one realizes that we cannot know. So, it was written in two languages. We don't really know why. Um, and the languages don't have even, they have overlap in, you know, if you have the two main breaks of, of, uh, of Daniel, 1 through chapter 6 is kind of the narrative portions. And then 7, 8, and, and the rest are about visions and dreams and things like that. And so, even, even that, this Hebrew Aramaic portion will overlap in that. Um, there are any times you try to theme the book out or, or, well, there's parts in Hebrew and parts in Aramaic. It just makes very little sense of how you can divide them. Um, but it was written in Hebrew and in Aramaic, and some would say that it's written in Aramaic just so that the, the worldly kingdoms could read as well. Do you have something you want to add? So was that, I was going to ask about Aramaic. The, was that a, broad, a widespread language, or where did that come from? Yes. Um, so that's, it's likely that Jesus also would have spoken um, Aramaic. It's, it's a, we'll put this way, from what I understand, it was kind of like, well, that's a, a bad representation, but it's a little bit like English is today. It's, it's, a, it's a, or we'll put Greek after Alexander comes in. It's one of those languages that everybody speaks it, and um, it is a, an adaptation of lots of languages kind of mashed together, and so Hebrew and Aramaic are cousin languages, kind of, a little bit, and so um, another, I would say, large part of history of the Jewish people is, is that they had to start translating the Hebrew into Aramaic because there were not enough people that of Jews that were speaking Hebrew to understand the scriptures. There were times when they had to make some concessions because the, the language of the people was Aramaic and the language of, of Scripture was Hebrew. And so they had a lots of, uh, not necessarily divisions on that, but the language barrier was something that slowly became more and more prevalent because the people spoke the language of Aramaic and Hebrew was being less and less understood, less and less ta- uh, spoken. Um, and so that's why Hebrew is, is kind of, well... The, the, what we understand about the language of Hebrew is, is pretty fragmented in, in different ways because of the, 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 the way it didn't die like Latin, but it was definitely something that, that was on the decline at different times. And so Aramaic was just a common language um, that, that Daniel would have learned about and spoken. Um, again, we don't necessarily know why it's in uh, Aramaic, but those are the three languages of Scripture, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Um, and then it was translated into lots of other languages. Um, so we don't, again, language, it's there. We don't really know why. Um, Daniel, the book, the theme, and this is basically the same theme, um, God's providential care. 
God cares for his people. God cares for them and that it is something that he has set up. It is something that he has uh, planned on and it is something that he will always have a, uh, always have something for them. No matter, no matter if it's Jeremiah in the hometown, there's a prophet for you telling you, hey, God still loves you. God still cares. He's still in control. Even the first, uh, the very first couple, uh, I guess it's verse 2 of Daniel 1, and then the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. What, what, you know, uh, a lot of the, well, we'll get into that when you get into chapter 1. God's providential care. God rules over the kingdoms of men. Um, it is God giving the kingdom over into, into the hand of the Babylonians. It is God that is going to do these things. It is God that is going to shut the mouths of the lions. It's God that is uh, above even these natural or these large nations. Um, God's kingdom will rule over all. That, you know, you, you can't, that's the, the prophecies towards the end of the book will start telling us about God's kingdom that will never be shaken. That is uh, this rock that will come in and just destroy this, well, not necessarily destroy the statue, but that comes in is the, a kingdom that will never change, never be shaken, um, and God's kingdom will rule over all. So the book of Daniel, chapter 1. We'll get into that um, now, after I take a nice breath. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, chapter 1. Um, would someone mind reading for us the first seven verses of Daniel, chapter 1? What version of the Bible are you looking at? No, it don't matter. Just whatever I read from the ESV is, is, the, is the Bible that I have, but uh, it doesn't necessarily matter. I can do it. All right, Daniel one verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord handed Jehoiakim king of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house uh, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king told uh, Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom there was uh, no impairment, who were good-looking, suitable for instruction in every kind of expertise, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability to serve in the king's court. And he ordered Ashpenaz to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king also allotted for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and ordered that they be educated for three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them were from the sons of Judah were Daniel, uh, Haniah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name of Belshazzar, to Hannah, uh, Shadrach, to Michelle, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. You see, I, I uh, wanted someone else to read that so they could they could read those names for me. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, um, you know, obviously Daniel is and his buddies and his 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 three friends are taken captive. They are. Uh, I, I have a nice little drawing up there of, of someone just being taken captive um, from from the clip arts there. But they, they are they are being taken from their home out of nothing that they have done. Um, they are being taken from their home because of. Well, and, and as Daniel will say, because God gave uh, them into the hand of the Babylonians, um, God, God did this. Um, so on your little handout, um, we already kind of talked about A on your taken captive deal, but what happened early in the history of the kingdom that led Isaiah to prophesy that the people and possessions of the king would be taken to Babylon? What happened? Yeah, Hezekiah in Second Kings. Uh, we read from, I guess, on the screen was from Isaiah, um, and so I might have. I, I uh, anyways, Second. Where? Pages of Scripture are turning very slowly. Anyway, Second Kings, twenty. Second Kings twenty, and we'll just read that because uh, that's it's it's a good a good place to to go to look at this. But in Second uh, Kings chapter twenty. Um, we won't read the end because that most some of that was in Isaiah, but uh, at that time, uh, I get to read these ones. Uh, Merodach Baladan, the son of ba Baladan, king of Babylon, sent his envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he'd heard that Hezekiah had been sick. We read about this in Isaiah. We we studied about that. Uh, Heze Hezekiah welcomed them, showed them all his treasure. Uh, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oils, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm Hezekiah did not show them. 
So Hezekiah comes to King, he uh, so Isaiah comes to King Hezekiah and says, hey, uh, and then he reads from Isaiah 39, um, that, that some of your sons are going to be taken away. And so I, Daniel is being taken against his will to this place. Um, what did Nebuchadnezzar do with the vessels taken from the temple? Yeah, they, he took them to his temple. He, he, he said, so one of the things that we have behind the scenes underlying this, this entire deal um, is the Babylonian God is greater than the God of the, the Jews. And that's, that's the, the staple, that's, the, that's the, um, the thought process behind all of this, that whose God is bigger than whom? Well, whose, whose treasury has the treasury of the others? You know, whose, whose nation got destroyed by the other nation. And, and so part of the reason why this was so ingrained is because they believed that not only were kingdoms, that nations, that men were fighting, but that the gods, again, according to their pagan philosophy, that the god of the nation is going to bless that nation and bring them up. And their main chief purpose was that they could defend and conquer other nations. And so if, if my God's entire purpose is to, again, build us up so that we can defend ourselves and conquer other nations, that when we conquer another nation, well, our gods must have been better, greater. And so what they do is they kind of say that you know, all the things that you gave to your God, we're going to go ahead and take them and give them to our God because our God was clearly superior. Um, and again, we will see that these vessels will show up again in chapter 5. It's one of the reasons why they have a downfall. It's the, the writing on the wall story um, with Nebuchadnezzar's son. Um, but they take these vessels because they're trying to show that God, the God of Babylon is greater than the God of the Jews. Um, but again, this was done because the Lord gave them into his hand. Um, I guess this next question, question B on your, your handout, is pretty self-explanatory. They're all up there. But who are identified among the sons of Judah that were taken captive? You know, Jason, uh, Justin, <laughs> uh, Daniel probably didn't realize that he was getting a full ride to the Babylonian college. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, got, he got a full ride. Him and his, him and his friends are... <laughs> You, you're, that, that's, why, that's why I put it up there on the screen. You know, so Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are taken um, to the Babylonian uh, capital of, of Babylon. That's, that's a fun word play there. It's the Babylonian capital of Babylon. But um, anyways, they're, they're taken there, um, and these are the names that they have. They're, they're going to be given new names. But I guess, again, why were they chosen is, is the next question. It's because, again, that's, <laughs> because they were chosen because they're just like Justin. Uh, they're youths without blemish of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom. Um, just kidding. I, I would not have been taken. I would have been left at home to farm. Um, but anyways, <laughs> so uh, these men were taken because they're the best of the best. They're the best, the brightest, the, the, the greatest that, that the, Jew, the Jews have to offer. And uh, they, were, they were taken. So my question, or I guess the question on the deal is... Why were they given new names? Why were they given new names? I'll give you a hint. If you notice the last, I don't know, syllable, the last couple of letters in each of their names is very similar. Um, it, it is, it is uh, well, obviously there's, there's two of them that end in E-L and th two of them that end in I-A-H. All of their names are clearly linked to the god Jehovah. I-L, is, it stands for Elohim. It stands for part of the, the, the name for God. And uh, Hananiah and the end of Azariah, the end there, also is another name for God. And so their names are tying them to the God that they worshipped while they were in Jerusalem. But the Babylonians say, your God has been, he's been swamped. He's been wiped out. Your God no longer has any meaning, no longer has any power, no longer has any uh, purpose for your life. So we're going to wipe that out. And if you notice, all of the next names that they're given, Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Again, they didn't, they didn't change their, uh, their name very much. And other than Hananiah, kind of, he's, every, everyone else, you know, his name was Meshach, uh, Mishael. And his name is now Meshach. And Azariah is, is Abednego. Now, they're very close. And then Hananiah, he got left out, the short stick. He had to totally get a new name. But, uh, but anyways, all of their names, um, and I'm going to read on... I love I loved that one. Uh, jokes for later. Um, there we go. 
in the notes that Jason had from, from a couple weeks, uh, well, weeks, a couple years ago, if you look at the top of your handout, it says 2009 um, was the last time that this study was done. But uh, he said that Mark Copeland gives this synopsis of the meaning of the names. Daniel, God is my judge. Hananiah, the Lord is gracious. Mishael, who is what God is. And Azariah, the Lord helps. And they get their names all changed, all wiped out to worship the gods of the Babylonians. Belshazzar, that Daniel's name is, is turned to, is, is also, the meaning of that is a servant of Bel. Shadrach is in, inspired by the sun god. Meshach is who is what the moon god is, who is like the moon god. And Abednego, the servant of Nebo. So they took all of their uh, ties to the god that they served, the god that apparently Egypt had, or uh, Babylon had destroyed and gave them new names, gave them uh, names of the Babylonian gods. Um, so the last question here for this first section, what purpose was served by Nebuchadnezzar taking members of the royal family from Jerusalem to Babylon? What was the, why, why would Nebuchadnezzar have done that to these people? One thing is, is that if he takes the royal family, that kind of eliminates... Uh, the, the the urge to rebel, uh, you know, you've taken the, you're taking the the royal family, so you don't have the, the people uh, there to rebel, you know, the, to, to rise up against them. Yeah, on on the one hand, uh, that that on that you know on on that uh, what do you want to call that? The one side of this coin is that you know the the leaders are no longer there, so the likelihood of that nation. Um, rising up against you because well, all of the aspiring, inspiring, we'll put, put it that way, all of the inspiring men that would say, hey, get behind me, let's revolt against these people. They're all gone. There's no one there that, that Babylon would say is, is equipped to uh, rise up against them. Um, what would be another reason that he would take them back to his palace? The the best to, to serve him. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's removing them from his enemies, from the people that could revolt, but also bringing them into his court, into his, um, you know, uh, what are those people called? Advisors, that's the word I was going for. Um, so, yeah, he's, it, it's, it's a twofold approach. Weaken them and strengthen me. Uh, Ezekiel 17, um, we'll, we'll go there and, and read that. It's uh, part of the notes, but uh, verse 11 of Ezekiel uh, 17 says that then the word of the Lord came to me say now to this rebellious house do you not know what, uh, what these things mean tell them behold the king of Babylon he came to Jerusalem took her king her princes and brought them to Babylon and he took one of the uh, one of the royal offspring and made a covenant with him putting him under oath the chief of the land he had taken away that the kingdom might be humble and not lift itself up and keep his covenant that it might stand and so what, he's, what, what, what Ezekiel will, you know, in the spirit will say that one of the reasons they did that is so that the, the, the princes, the, you know, people that are socially adept, the people that could cause the rebellion are all indebted to me. They're all with me and they're not with them. Um, so what did the king expect of these young men? What was expected of them by the king of Babylon? wanted them to be educated and fed in a certain way. Yeah, he wanted them, I mean, yeah, at the very end it says uh, they were to be educated for three years. They, they needed a lot of learning. Uh, Johnny brought up the fact that they, they had to learn a lot if they were learning for three years, but maybe it was like, you know, never mind, that's a bad, I'm not going to say that. Uh, they were educated for three years, um, and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. Other translations will say to serve the king. They were expected to Again, we don't really know what, what that means, but to stand before them. They were to get educated. They were to be, um, apparently, as we will continue to read on, they were supposed to be, um, well, let's put it this way. Um, verse 20. Um, we'll get to this later, but chapter 1, verse 20 says, In every matter of wisdom and a understanding about which the king inquired of them. So that's going to be one of the expectations the king has, is the king is going to come and inquire of them, and again, we'll read that he will find Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah with Daniel to be 
ten times greater, ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters of his kingdom. And so what's going to be expected of him is for them to be not only his advisors, but in some way magicians, enchanters, and things that he will go to with, with questions of, of importance. Um, he also expected them to obey without... Um, what do you want to call that? Obey with no resistance or you die. That was what we'll see many different times throughout the book of Daniel, that the way that kings treated other people, specifically their captives, were a <laughs> do or die and not in the good sense. Do what I say or die. Um, and so that's what the king will expect of these young men. Um, I put up there that they went off to Babylonian college, and I wanted to stop and make that application um, right now because these young men... Um, again, they're much younger than me. Maybe so they, they weren't like me anymore. They're much younger than me. I'm 25, um, or 20, yeah, 25. So anyways, they were a little bit younger than me, and they were going off to Babylonian college. Babylonian college is going to be one of the most wicked places where you're going to learn about wicked things, and you're going to learn about how to do wicked things in, in great ways. You're going to learn how to serve wicked people, and you're going to learn to be wicked. And yet, even there, we will see the people of God remaining faithful to him. Remaining faithful even in, no matter what they're taught, no matter what they're told, they're going to be faithful to God. And so I think, again, we think about these being the best and the brightest. And I think that they truly were, especially in the spiritual sense. Because I think sometimes, you know, don't, don't name any names, but we can all think of people that were in the church, but when they went off to college. Now obviously they didn't go to the Babylonian college, where, uh, but, but they go off to college and their faith falls apart. Yet these men will go to one of the, the valley in the shadow of death for a Jewish person, and they will, again, we will see that there are things that they have to abstain from. There are things that they have to do that, that put their life in jeopardy, and yet they're still going to remain faithful. Um, and so we're reading some, some really respectable men that will remain faithful even in uh, difficult situations, um, even when all around them is saying, just give in. <laughs> Jerusalem's a long ways away. <laughs> Those people, uh, they don't matter anymore. Your old life is gone. Um, but they will remain faithful. Um, so the next couple of verses here, uh, verse 8 through 16, Daniel 1, 8 through 16. Um, I'll go ahead and read that. But Daniel uh, resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. God gave, him, uh, God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has signed your food and drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us give, be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this manner, tested them for ten days. But at the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. The title of this was Daniel Takes a Stand. Daniel Takes a Stand. So what situation arose that caused this dilemma? Why was this a dilemma for Daniel and his three friends? Why couldn't they just eat the king's food? One kosher, yeah. One kosher, one good. Wasn't, uh, you know, most people will say two, two, two great points. I like three. Obviously, the second one is still basically the first one, but I like three points. Three points sounds better. But the first thing is, is it was probably not proper Jewish food. Um, if you look in Leviticus chapter 11, there's, there's a long list of don't eat this. And if, if there's an animal that chews a cud and has a split hoof, go ahead. If it don't chew the cud or it don't have the split hoof, you can't do that. And it will go through and it will list, you know, the rabbit and some random animal I'd never heard. I had to look it up. Um, I don't even know how to say it. Um, but anyways, there was lots of, you know, and they, they brought up a camel. Well, it doesn't have the split hoof, so you can't eat that. And the pig, you know, it doesn't chew the cud, so you can't eat that. And, and there's this long, long list. And at the end, um, verses 44 and 47 say, Do not eat these and do not defile yourself because God is holy and you should be holy. So do not defile yourself. And so they were likely... Not proper Jewish food. They were probably, you know, I don't know if they had camel meat or pig meat or other kinds of meat that were given that they, were, they, they should not eat because it was specifically said, don't eat that animal. Point number two, which again is basically point number one, 
um, but dressed up because I need another point for three points. <laughs> the second point would be it would maybe it wasn't prepared properly. Again, in uh, Leviticus, there are times when it says, do not, you know, uh, you can't eat meat that's been boiled in its own blood, and you have to drain the blood, and you have to do these certain things. And when you prepare it, it has to be prepared a certain way, or it's, it's in, uh, unclean. And so there are ways in which maybe the, the meat, the, the things they were eating, were not prepared properly either. And the third one um, is it was likely sacrificed to idols. Um, again, it, it says in Leviticus 11, do not eat meat sacrificed to to idols. Um, this was a great, you know, uh, the way that I heard it is this was the Babylonians were killing two birds with one cow. Um, they would bring in the cow and they would say, if we're going to slaughter it and kill it anyways, well, we might as well slaughter and kill it to the glory of Nabu or to the glory of uh, Bel or, um, you know, bring it in and we can dedicate this kill to a god, you know, little g, god. We can dedicate the kill to, to a god and still get the meat. And so it was like, you know, it was just killing two birds with one cow. Um, they sacrificed and appeased the gods, and they also got some meat to eat. And so it was, again, li- very likely that the meat that they were uh, supposed to eat had been sacrificed to an idol. And Daniel says, this is not right for a man of God to do. Um, so um, these are the three things. The, the thing that I put up there, um, Justin's main reason, the, the thing that I think of, and again, it's very easy. I, I just wanted to say that it was something that, that I specifically thought of, but um, that, that Daniel, he was being faithful to God and not to King Nebi, not to King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, from some of the studies and research that I had done while studying for tonight, there was, there was some that would, that would make the case that Daniel was being groomed, was being prepared, was being brought up to be a priest of, of Nebuchadnezzar, kind of. Um, they, they would turn to all of these different terms that they use. You know, the, the term that, uh, verse 4, youths without blemish. And, you know, in, in Leviticus it talks about how the priests were to be without blemish, how the, the, the sacrifice was to be without blemish. And so the specific Hebrew word that they use is trying to draw us back to that imagery of, of the temple and the priests there and the, and the sacrifices. Um, and that's, that's the description that they have for the people that, that, that Daniel are to be. Um, verse 5, it says the king assigned them food to eat. Um, and, they, and some will say that there's, a, there's imagery here from what God did in the garden as he assigned you know, Adam and Eve to eat of these things. And so they're kind of putting the king of Nebuchadnezzar um, in, the, in the seat of God. And so when the king gives them these things to eat, you know, uh, Daniel is, is essentially becoming a priest of Nebuchadnezzar, saying that he is God, saying that, you know, um, I am a priest in his temple, if you will. Um, but I, I think that's an interesting thought. I don't necessarily know if I would see that specifically in the text. But what we do know is that Daniel is saying, you know what, it doesn't matter what King Nebuchadnezzar wants. It doesn't matter how far away from home I am. It doesn't matter who, I'm, who I am with. I am going to remain faithful to God even under threat of death because that's exactly what the chief eunuch says. The chief eunuch says, if, if something goes wrong, I can die. If something goes wrong, you can die. We all might die. Um, the heavens, the sky is falling. Um, but anyways, the, the main reason, I think, is because Daniel was choosing faith rather than convenience. Um, you know, he could have come up with any number of excuses. Again, I'm so far from home, nobody's going to know. Everybody else is doing it. Do you think that, well, who knows? Maybe this, you know, the, this, this description is pretty, pretty pinpoint, you know, when it says uh, to, to, the, to Ashpenaz to, to go and grab these men. Do you think that there were more than just four Jewish men in the entire kingdom that were of good appearance without blemish and all wisdom and dad with knowledge? Or was there just four? I don't, I don't know if we know. But it's likely that there were other Jewish men, other Jewish young men, that were there as well, um, feasting at the king's table. And so I think that there is a, a, something to be said that, that Daniel and his friends said, you know what, this is, this is something we're not going to do. Um, so anyways, Daniel, um, what, what compromise was proposed by Daniel? What compromise? What did Daniel say? Hey, I, I, I do not want to do this, but what is the compromise here? How does, how does he go about this? Try it for 10 days, yeah. Try it for 10 days. That's, that's, a, uh, that's uh, exactly what he does. And essentially, the way that he does it, and that's the, the little exclamation points at the bottom of the deal, is, is he says, you know, Daniel is not willing to defile himself, but he also isn't, isn't well, we'll get into that later, but he's not just going to 
pitch a fit. He's not going to have a conniption. He's not going to just whine and complain and sit on his bed and cry. He's going to find a solution that allows him to remain faithful to God and yet still allows him to avoid uh, political unrest and, and danger. He will say, hey, um, test us, test your servants. One of the things that, that has been read all the time is that I think it's good for Christians to say, you know what, test me, God. I am, I am faithful. I am going to remain true to you. My faith will withstand the test. And so if you're being tested, it's just to show, hey, um, I, am, I am living by faith and, and not by sight. But uh, Daniel says, test me for 10 days. Um, what objections does the commander have to, the, to his compromise? <laughs> he doesn't want to lose his head. He said, if this goes wrong, if something goes bad, I'm going to die. Um, I'm going to die. Um, and so um, Daniel will say, okay, well, if, if, you, if this does go wrong, then, then that's great. But let us, give us a little test, give us 10 days. So they're supposed to appear before the king. They're going to stand before the king. They're going to be before the king in three years. Surely 10 days um, is not going to um, affect, you know, the, uh, the outcome. So again, if, if, it's, if it's terrible, if this doesn't work, and you have to make us eat the other stuff, um, you still have time. He still gives, you know, the, the chief eunuch um, or the steward of the chief eunuchs um, to, um, I guess, correct the mistake or whatever. But, but Daniel's compromise is something that, that was... Um, was good for everyone. Um, when, when he did it, he, was, he did it in such a way that was wise. Again, it said earlier that he is a wise man. He's a wise dude. But when he makes this compromise, he makes it in such a way that, that is not obtusely aggressive against, well, I'm not going to do this, and you can't make me do this. Um, and he doesn't do it in such a way that, just, that, that is very um, weak-willed of, well, I really don't want to do this, but if you make me, I'll do it. No, he comes out and he finds a great decision. He finds a great compromise, and he says, give us this test. And by this test, what, what, what does this test of 10 days, how does that show great faith and trust in God? By Daniel saying, give us just vegetables, um, how does that show faith in God when, when he said, Tell, give us this? Well, he, 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 he thought he was going to work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he believed that God was going to come through for him. And again, you know, I don't know about you, but uh, 10 days is, is a relatively good time, period of time, to see if, if a certain diet is going to do anything. Um, it's not too short of a time where, you know, it's like, well, for one day, I'll show you. You know, you, you put me up against JJ, and you give me nothing to eat for a whole day, and we'll come back, and I'll still look pretty similar. But if you give me nothing to eat for many days, I might look a little different. It takes a little while for these things um, to occur. So in 10 days, uh, Daniel was saying, you know what? I, he, is, he is faithfully trusting God because on one hand, if this doesn't work out, he might be killed. I mean, it, it's plain and simple. If, if this doesn't work out, off with his head. But he's trusting God and saying, you know what, God, if we do this, there will be, you will move, you will act. So what happened at the end of these 10 days? Yeah. They, were, they were fatter and better in appearance. Again, I don't know who the, who the, 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 the judge was of that on, on uh, you know, I don't know what you call those, the, the beauty pageant of Babylon. But uh, they, were, they were coming in and they were better in appearance and funny enough, uh, fatter, so that's a that's a good thing. You know, <laughs> you want to tell your uh, yeah, it's it's well, it's a good fat. Yeah, so back then, fat was a good thing. It was it was um, it was to show that you know you were you were healthy, you were being taken well care of. Um, they were they were fatter, better in appearance, and so um, I did want to say one 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 more time that um, this vegetarian diet give us only vegetables. The um, Hebrew word there is seeds. Um, and so, again, that can be any kind of vegetable. Um, fruit would even fall, but again, fruit was not very prevalent in the middle of the desert um, at this time. Um, but they, they, it was, again, it's not just, well, all they had was, was carrots and peas. There was, there was a lot under that umbrella. It was just essentially, we're not going to eat the meat, and we're not going to drink the wine. Um, give us a vegetarian diet, and in 10 days, they were fatter. Now, I don't know about you, but most people that I know that are either vegetarian or vegan or whatever don't seem to be getting fatter. <laughs> people tend to do that because they want to lose weight, not, not gain it. 
And so I think that they're, again, I don't know if they just ate <laughs> absurd quantities of vegetables to, get, to gain, you know, but, but I think God was moving here. God was blessing their effort. God was blessing the things that was happening in their life. At the end of the 10 days, they were, they were given um, a, a blessing, and they, and they were um, able to do this from, from the rest of their, their time. Um, I just wanted to read a couple things that, that uh, was in the notes, but uh, this, was, this was customary for the royalty to support these um, advisors, officials from the, the royal income, from the royal tables, and so they were, um, this was not like a, wow, I can't believe Babylon did this. No, this was just something that um, likely would do. They were given food of the same quality, the same type that the king ate. They were at the king's table. They were getting the, the prime rib. Um, but uh, undoubtedly, the Babylonians believed this was an honor. This was, this was, you know, I can't believe that you'd be <laughs> upset that we're giving you some of the best our kingdom has to offer. Um, but, but the Israelites said, I uh, would rather not do this. Um, it's kind of interesting to me because it's almost like brainwashing for them. Because they're giving them the best of everything. They're bringing them in, they're treating them like royalty, basically. They have everything they need, they're... I mean, they do have to do what, what the king says, but they have everything, and they and that every, the best of everything. But they're making a choice not to take the food, but they're not, like you say, not making a big stink about it, but, but say, watch, look, see what happens. Everything will be okay. You know, these, these were brought in to Babylon, you know, and they wasn't made to do common labor, common work, common slave type stuff, you know, these, these, they had, they had, they were being educated by the, by the best people and, and had all the, you know, training and stuff like that uh, to, you know, to be, have, to be able to get along in the Babylonian culture, you know, they, they, they had everything given. Yeah, you know, when they come in, they, they, weren't, they weren't prisoners of war. They were, they were um, groomed, set up to be nobles of the, king of, of, of the king of Babylon. And so they were given all these great things. And as Don was saying, you know, that's, that's one of the other things in one of these paragraphs that I uh, looked over and didn't remember to read. But the idea was that they're trying to indebt them of like, hey, this is a great honor. We're, we're honoring we're, we're giving you all these great things. It's, it's a brainwashing. It's saying, hey, come over to our side. Leave everything behind that, that you once knew and be flattered, be honored, be respected, be glorified by us so that you are indebted or whatever um, to our king. Um, one, of, one of the things on here that uh, Jason wrote was their abstention. Well, fun, fun big words there, but I'm glad I can speak it, uh, spell it. The abstention from all meats. They were vegetarians. We, we, we're not going to eat any meat. Not even, not even the ones that are kosher. We're not going to eat any meat. Their abstention from all meats was the only way they had to ensure they did not participate in something sinful. They didn't necessarily know if it was sacrificed to idols. They didn't necessarily know what animal that it was coming from when it was on the king's table. Because, well, maybe they were just really good at knowing their cuts of meat. But um, they abstained from all meat because they had no way of verifying if what they were eating had been offered uh, as a sacrifice or if it was clean meat that had been set before them in a proper way. So there's a, there's a good application here, as Jason will continue on, that instead of pushing the boundary, sorry about that, uh, pushing the boundary, pushing the scope and saying, well, you know, I'm going to... I'm going to taste it and try, oh, that tastes like pork. I can't eat that. Or, or I'm going to look at it and say, well, this one looks good and this one doesn't. And, and instead of trying to get as close as they can, they continue to say, you know what? I am going to abstain from all meats because I do not know if this was sacrificed to idols because I do not know what animal this comes from. And so uh, what Jason will say is our typical question is, am I sinning? Is this activity, is this thing, is this a sin that I am going to engage in? Okay, well, if it's a sin, then I won't do it. But if, if I can't say, well, that's definitely not a sin, or that definitely is a sin, then it's okay. Um, but our typical question is, is activity a sin? Should be replaced with, is this activity holy? Is this holy? Daniel is, and his friends couldn't be sure that all of the meat they were given was proper, so they refused to eat any of it. Um, and he will ask his question, how would our individual lives be changed if rather than seeing how close we can get to sin without partaking, we instead sought ways to remove sin as far away from us as possible? Um, I think that's a good, a good principle of, of, of living holily, 
and not living um, as close to the edge as we can. Um, we've uh, done all this. This is great. Um, the end of 10 days. So the ending of this chapter, we'll go ahead and finish it out here in the next uh, three minutes, about enough time to read it. Um, but verses 17 through 21, God's blessing. Uh, As for the three youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all dreams and visions. Um, at the end of this time, when the king commanded them, they should be brought in. So the three years later, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 19, and the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all of his kingdoms. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. So, um, I put some points up there. I was trying to be a little more laid back, but God helped them learn. God helped them learn. That's the blessing that God gave them. God would say um, a lot of these notes and things that, that, are, that are written on here for this specific um, question of how did Daniel bless, uh, how God blessed Daniel and his free friends, he, he helped them understand. Um, a lot of the things in here, um, we're talking about how, um, let's just read it here. Um, well, if I try to read it, I'm, it's, it's difficult for me to verbalize the great things that are written because it takes a long time to get to the end of their sentence because they wrote them so cleverly. Um, But essentially what they're trying to say is that when God helped them, God divinely put his finger on the scale and helped them to continue to to, um, learn and make good use of all the knowledge and opportunities afforded them. So, on one hand, they were they still had to go to class. They couldn't skip Babylonian, you know, history 1 and Babylonian chemistry 2. They had to go to class to learn and they had to be there to learn, but God helped them. God aided them. God gave them learning and skills in all nature. So, um God's providence prevailed for the use in every way, but God did not do for them that which they could do for themselves. They are to be credited for having learned and made good use of all the knowledge and opportunities they were afforded them. The finger, so to speak, of the overriding providence of God is manifested in this study and will continue to be so throughout the rest of the book of Daniel. He is he is going to help them and aid them, and at this point, he is not... I don't believe, miraculously just saying, learn all this stuff, and it just appears in their brain. But it is something that God is blessing them as they are, as they are learning, as they are growing, as they are developing. God is blessing them. Um, what did King Nebuchadnezzar think of Daniel and his friends? Uh, he thought, y'all are awesome. Um, he said, y'all, y'all are pretty neat. You, you guys are pretty cool. Um, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about he, what he inquired them, he found them ten times greater, which I don't know how you would, maybe they were, I don't know. I don't know how that would work out. But they were ten times greater than, than everybody else. Um, and so God blessed them. Um, what, what responsibilities did Daniel and his friends earn because of, of their knowledge, their wisdom, and the blessings that God had given them? What, what responsibilities did they have now? In the service of the service. They, yeah, they were in service to the king. Verse At the end of verse 19, it says, Therefore, they stood before the king. They, they were in service to the king. They were some of his chiefest, chiefest advisors. Um, so that's the end of Daniel 1. I think that the very last verse, some people will say, is a little bit um, interesting. Um, but verse 21 says, Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. But what that means is that Daniel was continuously blessed throughout the entire reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel will be put in a place of great uh, authority, a great position, and Daniel will stay there until the first king, or until the first year of King Cyrus. And even in King Cyrus's reign, we will see that when he's thrown in the lion's den, King Cyrus is like, yo, I did not mean to do this. Daniel is great. Daniel is awesome. I want to keep Daniel in my corner. But Daniel uh, will be thrown in the lion's den. And so Daniel was provided, provided for, and uh, God continued to care for him for a long time after this. Um, Thank you for your attention tonight.